John 6:63, Jesus said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, and they are life. The message you are about to listen to are words of life and spirit from Pastor Obina and Michael. Stay turned, be connected and be blessed. How many of you were here on Sunday? Wave at me if you were here. Did you learn something? You heard something. Okay, let's say you heard something. A problem, you didn't learn something. Or you learned something. You did. And it's concerning yearly worship and word sacrifice. Then there was a part I told you I skipped. And the reason I did that was because of time. Sometimes you encounter certain people who I told you what the yearly worship was from the man Elkanah, which means God obtained. You remember? Or God created, which means if a believer would want to obtain something from the Lord using Elkanah, as a reference point, then that believer must be able to function by the principles that Elkanah established. And one of those principles we saw in the scriptures was that the Bible tells us he would yearly have what we call the yearly sacrifice and worship. And that is how he commands his own year to open up. The moment he does that, his year is opened up automatically. And I was trying to use that to teach you how that you can command the secret of commanding without you having to speak and say, I'm commanding, I'm commanding, I'm commanding, even though that is good. But there are other ways by which you can actually function without speaking like that. And I told you the reason was because I never saw Christ moving in the scriptures and saying, I have the life of God in me. I am a child of God. I have what God says I have. I will not fail. I will not do this. But yet the man was in charge and had result. And if we're going to function like Christ, then we should be able to follow the pattern that Christ has laid down in the scriptures that would guarantee our result like him. And one of them is tapping into the principle that Elkanah, God, obtained give to us that the man would observe what he called the yearly worship and sacrifice and i told you that sacrifice there in context there speaks of what we call the first fruit you remember the first fruit that you take your first fruit and that becomes your yearly sacrifice with the worship and you go before the lord and that go in there the place where you and God meet is what the Bible calls there in that context, Shiloh. Are you with me? But there are people you will meet and they will tell you that thing does not exist. That Christ has become our first fruit. Now I want to read that. Let's, let's look at that. Romans chapter 11 first. Let's look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And we'll read verse number 16. Now, this is Paul casting a very big importance on the subject of the first fruit. And Paul says, for if the first fruit be holy, he says the lump is also holy. Now, the lump there is the ones that come after. Meaning that if I ever give God my first fruit from my produce, from my business, from my contract, from my transactions, it is of necessity that the lumps, the lump that will come after, surely the Bible says will become holy because I have set aside the first one which is my first root and I've given it to God. And if the roots be holy, so are the branches. Now, the people who try to contradict or speak against the principle or the doctrine of the first fruit. They will always cite this and tell you, do you know what this means? And you say no. So they pick you to another scripture and that is in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 20. We'll also look at that 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and verse number 20. 1 Corinthians 15 and verses number 
20. All right? Now, they read it like this in verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits. Now, you know, sometimes I just look at certain people and the way and manner in which they approach biblical terms, biblical writings, without carrying the understanding of it. Now, you want to have an argument and you just speak a verse of scripture and you now begin to like speak about it. I told you the Jewish people have what we call the seven feasts. One of them is the feast of the first fruit. But the first fruit here that the Bible is talking about, you must understand what we are speaking here. Okay? Are you with me? All right? I will come to this then. But let's, let's do something. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. We'll come back to 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But let's just do, let's read Proverbs chapter 3 verse 9. Hallelujah. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. You know the man is talking about something here. That you honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of thine increase. The first fruit of your increase. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Can we do message translation? Substance. Let's look at substance. You will see what it gives us. Look at it. Honor God with everything you own. Give him the first and the best. Give him the first and the best. Now, the New Living Translation cast another light. <laughs> Honor the Lord with your wealth, substance. Honor the Lord with your word, wealth, substance. And with the best part of everything you produce. Are you there? So now this is the substance he's talking about. Okay? Now let's travel to 1 Corinthians now 15 verse number 20. So now you know what he's talking about. Wealth, substance, and that which you have. Now look at this verse now. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead. The subject matter here has nothing to do with substance. It has nothing to do with wealth. It has nothing to do with produce. But just because Christ was mentioned as the first fruit, so they assume that what he was talking about is that he has canceled that other first fruit he's talking about that Christ now has become the first fruit. But come down, just watch this. It says, but now is Christ risen from the dead and because he's risen from the dead, he has become the first fruit of them that slept. He became the first fruit of them that slept. He didn't become the first fruit of your produce. He became the first to come out from spiritual death. The reason he came out of that and became the first is so that you and I can now taste it. He didn't become your first fruit of your produce and your substance. No, he tasted death for you. He became the first. Give me the amplified. He became the first to taste of spiritual death. Watch this now. You think I'm lying. Watch this one. But the fact is that Christ, the Messiah, has been raised from the dead. And he became the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep in death. He became the first fruit of those who have fallen asleep. Not first fruit as of produce and substance. Go back to King James. Why did Paul put this? There must be a reason as to why the man touched this part. Should I give you the reason? The reason is, in, is found in verse 18 into 19. Let's start from verse 18. Look at verse 18. 
In verse 18, it says, Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. Which means there was a debate that there are those who died in Christ. If they die like that, it says everybody has died because that is the, the generic understanding. That if people die, that's all. He says, but what about those who died in Christ? Are you saying to go back? I mean, I'm still in verse 18. Are you saying that those who have died in Christ has perished? That they've perished? That there's no hope for them because they have died? He now came to verse 18, verse 19. He now says, if we are, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable because what he was arguing was that, see, there is life after. And some people say it's a lie. Life ended here. And Paul said, no, there is life after. He now said to the believers, if in this life only, if it is only in this life, that all of this, our argument ends here, we are of all men most miserable. They were now looking. What is this guy saying? He now got to verse 20 by telling them now, look at verse 20. But now Christ rose from the dead to show us that he's a prototype. That since he rose from the dead, he became the first food. That means the first to taste it of them that slept. Because of that now, look at verse 23. Because of that now, but every man in his own order, Christ, the first food, afterward, they that are Christ at his coming. Because he tasted it, now you and I, that is why you and I can lay claim to one thing, that there's going to be a resurrection. Because if Christ did not come back, there is nothing. But because he came back, he became the first fruit of those that slept and came back. He is not the first fruit of your substance. The one I was teaching about yearly worship and sacrifice is the first fruit of your substance, not Christ. He is our first fruit of them that slept spiritual death. Proving to us that if we die in Christ, we will be raised. But he is not your first fruit of your produce. Jesus Christ is not cash crop. He's not your first salary. He's not your first contract. So the people that read this and give that interpretation do not understand scriptures. Are you with me? Did you get it now? So sometimes you hear argument and people can just be speaking. They say things out of context. Okay, go to chapter 16. The same 1 Corinthians. Look at verse 15. 1 Corinthians 16, 15. If you have never encountered these people, don't worry. But I'm telling you the truth. You're going to encounter them even in your family. Some people are going to tell you, you people are just so stupid. You carry all your money. You go and give him one man. The man will be telling you people that Jesus Christ has blessed you. You now say, I'll be you. <laughs> Stay there. Let them be deceiving you. You may say you didn't think about it, but later you go and sit down somewhere and now begin to ruminate over that thing. It's better you didn't hear it. Satan will gather the, 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 the rudiment of those things. He gathers them, gathers them, gathers them. They form, they form something and now you now begin to brood over it. Are you sure that is not my money that is my used to buy shit? <laughs> you know one thing. When it comes to the issue of money, the truth is, I, I've said this before. I didn't mean when you come, <laughs> You know why the thing is hard? It's because I'm the one collecting it. <laughs> Hadn't been you see Elohim in fire. And he said, blessing, say, sir, but I'm there. And he dropped it, fire just got pop. He said, hmm, the Lord has received it. <laughs> you will not, there won't be debate, honestly. There won't be debate. But because in your mind, let's say I have 10 daughters who earn 30, 30,000. And they drop their 30,000. 30, and you call, that's 300,000. Then the next day, you see me eating turkey and drinking Coke. You're just saying, now that money be that. <laughs> <laughs> because in your mind, 
<laughs> I'm telling you, that's how people reason. So because of that, some people will now come out. There are some of you here, some of you here. You are only pretending, but that is, it goes through your mind. Yes. That's for 30,000. It has not gotten to the level of 200 million. Because if you have 10 daughters too, who give to 200 million? By 10, that's 2 billion. Huh? Then, the man buys Ferrari. You see? Then he tells you the Lord has blessed him. He says, now, now that's our first fruit. Where we gather, give a nine use by the Ferrari. Now they tell us a God. So, but if it's a spirit that collects it, there won't be, I'm telling you, there won't be any argument in the body of Christ. And that is where faith is required. That's why God says, go and take it and give it to that man. That is my representative. And when you give it to him, take your eyes off of whatever you find. Because without that thing, he has been drinking coke. So don't assume now that it is that your own. Because you gave it to him the next day you saw coke and talking. Say, now that's our money with this. No. I beseech you, brethren. You know the house of Stephanus. And it is the first fruit of Acha. Can you see this now? That's what I was telling you. The first fruit of the church we planted in Asia. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. He said, I want you to know that these people are the first fruit. Are you going to say now that those people that are arguing that Christ has become our first fruit? What about this one? <laughs> they say, no need. Christ has become your first fruit. He has become your tithe. Because he became our offering. So tonight, haven't understood that. Give me Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 3. There was something I did mention on Sunday. Genesis chapter 4 and verse number 3. Tonight is going to be brutal because we will answer some hard questions. And the title is, Why is it that you find some believers? Why do some givers don't receive? Why do they not receive? Why do you find people who give to the house of the Lord, give to the project of God, give to God? Why do you find people who give tithe, who give first truth, who give offerings, and yet they do not receive? Why do some believers don't receive? Why? Not even just some believers. Why do some givers, why is it that some givers don't receive? Very interesting. Why? I remember um, telling us, and please take note of this, the answers I'm going to give, I always say this, I am not the almighty God. Which means that you could have more than the answers I would give because I am not God. But the ones I'm giving you tonight are the ones I'm permitted by scriptures, by the spirit to give to you. And over time in the years, as the spirit of God worked with us and revealed things to us, we could also find some fragments that we could add to the ones that we have already taught you. Are you with me? But why is it that some givers don't receive? Why? Is it that you find certain givers in the house of God and they do not receive? I remember telling us in Genesis chapter 4 verse 3, we read that on Sunday and we saw something. Here. And in the process of time, the Bible says it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, an offering unto the Lord, an offering unto the Lord. I told you that word offering there connotes certain things. There are certain synonyms you also find with it. One of them is gift. I remember I told you, one of them is sacrifice. Do you remember? And another one is tribute, tribute, tribute. Now, a gift is something you don't work for. Are you with me? It just comes. It just comes. A sacrifice carries an obligation. There's a reason as to why you want to offer a sacrifice. 
A tribute is something you owe. A tribute is something you owe. That was why Jesus told them. When they came to Jesus and said, they arrested, they wanted to arrest him for not paying tax. And they asked him, he said, Jesus said, whose face is on the coin? He says, Caesar. And he says, give to Caesar that which belongs to Caesar and to God that which belongs to God. Which means, he says, pay the tribute of Caesar to Caesar and the tribute of God to God. But all of them still found themselves in the contest or in the name called offering. That sometimes when you see a man dip his hand in, the, in his pocket and pulls out an offering and is coming to present it to God, it either stands as a gift, as a sacrifice, or as a tribute, something he owes God. Are you with me now? So now you watch this now. When it comes to the gift, there are certain things you must understand. First and foremost is this. Giving is an act of faith. Every child of God, giving is an act of faith. Anybody you see that is giving, that wants to give, that is in the business of giving, that is faith already. Now, the degree of your giving is totally different. It's up to you and God. But I want to let you know that giving is an act of faith. Are you with me? It is believed by Jesus Christ that every giver must have his heart there. Because if you claim to love the Lord and you withhold your hand from giving to the Lord, then I want you to know that your faith is questionable. Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 21. He says something there. Look at Matthew chapter 6 and verse number 21. We're going to read it together. Are you ready? One, two, go. For where? Are you with me? Are you with me tonight? Let's do it together. One, two, go. For where your treasure is, there will your heart also be. You can, you can twist it. It can go vice versa. It can go up and down. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. Which means where your heart is not, your treasure cannot be there. You cannot be a faithful follower of God and your treasure does not speak. You cannot be a lover of giftings and your money, your substance does not speak there. Then it shows it's a proof that your heart is not there. If your heart is there, look up, look up. This is what I tell people. Anybody struggling in any department, first check the heart, it's not there. If you are giving the mic and you don't know the song to sing, if you fluctuate in rehearsals, or you don't attend meetings, or you don't do your duties when you are supposed to, the problem is that your heart is not there. If you give someone a song to score, you say score, um, um, let's say for instance, do sing, and you, are sto- you, you want to score Lagbaja, there's a great difference. Your heart is not there. If you keep reminding someone of a particular thing all the time, I put it to you that the heart of the person is not there. And there is no amount of cane that can reprogram the person's mind until the person goes back, sits down, and tells himself the truth that, see, I think I have a problem here. It is the problem of my heart. My own heart is not in this thing. The reason, first, as a preacher, that you should prepare your heart and know that you have an assignment is that you know that this thing is your heart. This is where your heart is. This is your heart. You bring a boy from the village to come and learn trade and by 5 a.m. other boys are awake, they are going out and by 8 he's still sleeping. The problem is that his heart is not there. He does not understand what he came to do. So, if you're a lover of Jesus Christ, in as much as you tell me, Pastor, I love worship. If your worship does not convert to you putting something on the altar, then your heart is not there. Because, according to this scripture, where your treasure is, if you have woken up and have ever given 500 million to the house of God, I tell you, I put it to you, and I say it categorically, and with so much capital letter and assurance, your heart is in that place. But if they call for the seed and call for offering and you only look for the change to put down, I tell you the problem is that your heart is not there. Your heart is not there. 
If you have never been moved by the instrument that your own ministry use, and you go online, you, you see other people use good instrument and they sing and you can hear them and you, it has never touched your heart to say, what, what is it that can make our own as lively as this? And they say, well, there's certain instrument you can buy and it can cost us like 20 million. You say, wow, why don't you say it? I may not have 20 million, but I have 5 million to support. It simply shows that your heart is there but if you are comfortable that all the chairs are broken and you can sit on the floor i tell you one thing it is not that you are not ashamed it is that your heart is not there so jesus is the one saying here for where your treasure is i don't know whether treasure you don't understand it whether treasure is human being he's saying that where your treasure is that means where your substance give me the amplified we'll break all the translations and you'll see it where your treasure is there will your heart be also. Can I have the message translation? We would begin to take it like that. Today's English. You see today's English. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. You will want to be and end up being because your treasure is there. Because your treasure is there. You will want to be there. You will want, you will want to, <laughs> can I tell you something? If you came to church and you noticed that there was no AC in the church and you single-handedly ordered for 20 split unit AC, you know one thing? If the, your friends, you have friends who invite you to their churches and in their churches they have AC and you feel comfortable and you've not been able to invite your own friends because you use hand fan. The day you order for those ACs and you install them, I tell you one thing, you will invite your friends. Why? Because that's where you want to be and you want to continually be. You know how to sit, but your money does not know how to speak. Let's give it. So Jesus is telling us here that there is something about that that your heart must be in the giving. So you look at the offering you look at the, one of the synonym gift, sacrifice, and tribute. Now, let's look at what the Bible says, the man of Solomon in Proverbs chapter 17. No, let's read verse chapter 18 first. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse number 16. Are you with me? Before I tell you why some givers don't receive, let me give you a little bit of the reward you get for giving. Mm. Because if there are no rewards for giving, I tell you, many people will not be hungry to give. There are rewards. Can we read together? One, two, go. A man's gift make way for him and bring at him before great men. Can we do that again? One, two, go. A man's gift make it room for him and bring it him before great men. Now, look at the word gift there. It's one of the synonyms of what? Offering. Which means, it, I can also put there a man's offering. Make it room for him. So one of the first, the first reward you get for giving is access. Your giving, your offering, your sacrifice, and your tribute can give you access. Access to where? Not to God. Not to God, child of God. Not to God. You already have access before God through Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, access to the Father without me. You go through Christ to get to the Father. So you and I, all of us now, are before the Father. So we have the access. We are before the Father. But when it comes to look at it again, a man's gift will make room for him. That means if you are ever going to have access granted to you that you have certain opportunity, your offering is required. Your offering can grant you that. That's what he's showing us. That means he can give you certain opportunities. Number two, he says, not only does he give you access, gives room to you, he says he bringeth you before great men. Which means your giving can make way for you to come before great men. You can have access before great men. You can have access before greatness. 
That you were born in a poor family does not change anything. You can have access before great men. Your giving can give you access before great men. This is the first thing you see. Whether you like it or not, there are certain doors he's telling you now that will be closed against you until a giving or a giving can open it. It can give you certain access. I know a friend who's been trying to like, um, there's a great um, business that someone introduced him to and the thing had to go through the, the seat of the presidency and they had to sign many documents and he said he has been trying to like, you know, get to the president and all of that until um, someone gave him um, an opportunity to see the special advisor, one of the special advisors to the president and he told him, he said, listen, there is nobody that goes to see that man like that. Document will not be signed. He said, be wise. You should know what I'm saying. We don't spell it out. So one of his friends dragged him and said, come here. You need to understand what they talk. Out of this whole thing, tell them that 5% belongs to them. And let them split it. So the moment he told him that, and he went to the presidency and said, we have 5% on the table, 3% for the president, and 2 for the other ones, they said, bring the document. And before you know it, they signed it. A man's offering gives him access. Go there and be singing. We shall be permanent. They will drive you out. They will chase you out. That's when you know that signatures are expensive. You think it's this one you sign in the bank. Who recognizes it? You see a signature that you just pre- eh? open the door. Why? The man is not there talking, but his signature is speaking. Stay and be fasting. And the man wagging you. Proverbs 17, 18. <laughs> Stay here. <laughs> a man's daughter, a man's servant was dying in the Bible. Huh? The, the servant was dying. The people came to Jesus Christ. He said, sir, this man, the servant needs attention. He said, I'm busy, I'm going somewhere. He said, sir, the people said, there's a reason you must go. He said, what? He said, this man single-handedly built the church. He said, let's go. This is your Jesus. You are here preaching. He, and this way they shall go to hell. Did he go? He went to hell for our sake. He tested it. Then he came out and closed the door so that we will not go. Jesus followed the man. He single-handedly. That means there was no contribution. He single-handedly. Build the church and call me. Let me see whether I will answer you. <laughs> and you tell me that it's, I, I will go to hell. He went. Build. <laughs> Brother Tony, you didn't hear me. Only me hear myself. We are doing renovations now. Huh? I saw, where's, they've already spent millions getting wood. I've not called for the offering. This thing is a law. By the time you come to, they will remove all of what you see here. Then somebody tells me, Pastor, I want to... How much will it take? It's okay. Everything we want to do. Because what we want to do is so much. Okay, sir. It's going to cost 15 million. Sir, I'll give it. And you will tell me that your wife is conversing midnight. And my phone is ringing. And I will not pick it. I'm t- Jesus Christ. <laughs> because sometimes, some people don't want to hear certain truth. Access. Somebody say access. access. Say access. access. Then you are calling my line. Say pastor is not calling. And you have not recharged it for one day. <laughs> Come and pick. They be phone me. <laughs> Say, see, all these men of God. I told you I am one simple person. I'm very truthful person. I will say it the way it is. Maskure do not eat offering. Yeah. If they drop Fanta here to give thanks, Thanksgiving, yeah. it shall be permanent. It's human being that will drink it. You know, drinker the other day. I follow drink, but not a drinker, but not a human being. I gave the right for them to drink it. So even if there's anything in it, it will not kill them because I permitted it. I am the altar boy and the altar boy gives permission for what happens on the altar and what comes from the altar. (laughs) There's nothing that will happen. This is the truth they don't want to hear in other places. I will say it. This is the way it is. So what is the problem? What is the problem? Why are you not reading certain scriptures? 
He said, have you not heard that they which walk on the altar, eat from what comes from the altar? So why are you making it look as if it's, it's something big? God does not eat pepper soup. The first time he, eat, he came down to eat it. He tasted the food men ate. And he was using toothpick. That was when he... he, he <laughs> access. Somebody say access. I can't hear you say access. A man void of understanding, striked hands. Should I tell you what striked hands is? Hey! That's number one. Number two. That means they tell you that death is coming. Say over my dead body. Over. You are striking hands. The death will kill you. He says, and he becomes shot in the presence of his friends. You, 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 you are still striking hands. What are you supposed to do? Now go to verse 8. Are you learning? Verse 8. But a gift is as a precious stone. In the eyes of him that had it, whithersoever he turneth it, it prospers. If Jesus could follow people because he single-handedly built a house, Jesus, Jesus, number two, I'm showing you rewards for it. Giving can prosper you. That means a man can prosper through giving. You say, how do I know? Proverbs chapter 3. From verse 9 into 10. Proverbs chapter 3, 9 to 10. Hurry up. We have plenty of scriptures to read tonight. And we have a lot to do. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all thine increase. What will now happen? Verse 10. It says, so shall thy bands be filled with plenty. And thy press shall burst out with new wine. Is it not there? That means your giving can prosper you. Your giving can prosper you. Hallelujah. It can prosper you. Number three. The rewards for giving. That's what I'm showing you. Acts chapter 10 verse 21. Acts chapter 10 verse 21. Then Peter went down, thank you Jesus, to the man which were sent unto him from Colonius and said, Behold, I am he whom you seek. What is the cause wherefore you are come? Now, you may not understand the background of the story, but take it from verse 1 into 2 into 3. It tells us about this Italian band whom the Bible says from verse 1 now. Look at it now. It says, hurry up. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Colinus, a centurion of the band called the Italian band. Verse 2, it tells us, a devout man and one that feared God with all his heart, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. Verse 3, the Bible now says in verse 3, he saw in a vision about the ninth hour of the day, an angel of the Lord coming into him and saying unto him, Colinus, he answered in verse 4, saying, and when he looked on, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thy arms are come up to me for a memorial before God. Which means your giving can stand as a memorial. Did you notice it was not prayer only? It was also giving. Prayer and giving stood up as a memorial before the person. Which means, my God. My God, something might have been destined to happen in 10 years of your life. 
Five years of your life, four years of your life, three years of your life, 20 years of your daughter's life. When she has graduated and she wants to get married and there's something the enemy has determined and the book of record be opened. And all of a sudden, there is a memorial that this guy in the year 1996 was able to give something unto the Lord that stood as a memorial. And God said, what is it that we gave back to that person? And they say nothing. But there's a calamity befalling the daughter. And he says, because of this, take that thing away. Memorial. You read the book of Esther in chapter 6. You read from verse 1. The Bible talked about how that the king went to bed and could not sleep. And he said, bring me the book of remembrance. There was a memorial written there. He said there was a guy who saved the king. And the king said, what was it that was done for the person? He says, nothing. He said, you mean a man did this kind of thing for the king and nothing was done? He said, bring him. Then he says, what is it that we can do to this man? Do for this man. And that was how. Mordecai was vindicated. Memoria. May God find, look into his archive and see what your giving has done that will stand as a memorial in the day of trouble for you. Amen. Can I hear better? Amen. Amen. Number four. Giving can prolong your life. Proverbs chapter 13 verse 8. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 8. Giving can prolong your life. I read it from my, I think we're having, Proverbs chapter 13. All right. The ransom of a man's life are his riches. But the poor will not hear a book. He won't hear. They are saying it, he says a lie. Something must kill a man. He's, <laughs> he says, but a man's ransom are the riches of his hand. That there is something coming. You can prolong your life by this. I'm showing you scriptures. I'm showing you scriptures. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Haven't then heard this, because I'm going to stop there. Why? Is it that, okay, sir, I'm a giver, I give. But why is it that I don't receive? Why do certain givers don't receive? I want to answer that. Why? It's not the first time of coming to the altar. I come, I give, I pledge, I vow, but I do not receive. So why is it what is the problem? What could be the problem? Why do certain givers don't receive? What could be the problem? How many of you would like to know? You just want to know. Maybe, maybe it's just add it to what you already know. Add it to some of the things you already know. Because it's one question you will always be confronted with. If not for you, your friends and people around you. Alright? Are you there? The first thing I want to say is this. Before you give, I want you to ask certain questions. You ask yourself certain questions. Before you do a dangerous giving. Now, the giving I'm talking about here is not 500 naira. But if that is your highest, beautiful. Start from somewhere. But I'm saying something here because there are people who have given cars, given houses, given lands, who had made vow, given hundreds of millions. There are people who have given billions and there are people who will give and enter into such realms. Because one of the things that giving can also do for you is that giving can change and alters your realm. I'm telling you, you can be in the realms of 10,000, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and all of a sudden you are launched into something by the wind of the spirit. Are you still with me? Before you give, ask yourself this few questions. Number one. Did I hear from God? Don't approach the altar blindly. Because there is something called emotional giving. God is not moved by your emotional giving. God is moved by your revelational giving. In your revelational giving, your emotion is also attached. Because Psalm 126 says, He that goeth forth, bearing precious seed. Huh? Are you still with me? He that goeth forth weeping, 
But bearing precious seed, weeping is a sign of our what? An emotion. You are going to the altar with that landed property, the document, but you are crying. Are you with me? Do not just be emotional. Be revelational. But even in your revelation, make sure that your emotion is attached to it. Because sometimes there's certain giving that the Lord urges you to do. And I'm telling you, it will bring tears out of your eyes. It doesn't mean it's a cry of unbelief. But it's a cry of, this is Lord, you have killed me. And until the corn of wheat falls to the ground, dies and germinates, it will not bear. So you are going to the altar, but you are crying. There's an emotion there. There's an emotion there. Hannah was crying. There was an emotion there. Because whatever she's telling God on that altar involves her life. She's going to hand her first child to God. Never to see that boy again. Except the boy wills. So before you give, ask yourself the first question. Did I hear from God? And when I mean hearing from God, you may not hear an audible voice. But what is your heart telling you? What is your heart telling you? The first thing you must judge is this. Satan will never ask you to give. That's already it. Because sometimes you hear people say, I don't know whether it's me. I don't know whether it's the devil. So I'm canceling one. Satan will never ask you to give. So you are left with you. To know now whether it is you. Do not be in a hurry to go and give. Take some time and pray and ask the Lord. If you continue to have that disturbance on your inside, where there is restlessness, there's no peace, I want you to know that the Lord is leading you. Because the absence of peace is the voice of God in such matters. That all of a sudden you lose your peace for the five million. You lose your peace for the house. You lose your peace for the clothes. You lose your peace for everything. And he's telling you that because there's a realm. There is something. You take some time. You take one week, two weeks. You go. The more you pray, I tell you, be sincere. If you sleep, you will still find yourself giving. You, you will dream giving. You will not have peace. I want you to know that that's the voice of God. The only time you will retain peace is when you have done that thing. The moment you drop it and you finish crying and that thing leaves, you turn your back. It's as if a weight of load is lifted out of you. I want you to know that you have just honored the Lord. Put your hands together for him. Did you learn something there? So that's the first thing. So don't wait until you hear, Tobe Choku, sir. I don't need to wait for that voice. Make a giver, no giver. Thank you, Lord. Because you do not want to give it before. You may not hear that voice audibly, but I want you to know that if you lack that peace on the inside, that heart continues to beat concerning that thing, then I want you to know that the Lord. But for some other people, they might see, hear a voice, see um, something in the dream, or be convinced through a vision and all of that. Are you with me? So before you give, ask yourself these questions. Have I heard from the Lord? Number two. The second question you should ask yourself before you give is, am I convinced about it? It's not enough to hear. Are you now convinced about it? Because conviction is one of the guiding light of the spirit. It is one of the ways by which God guides us, your conviction. So how do I know the conviction of the spirit concerning my giving? How do I take time to pray in tongues? Yes. Praying in the spirit and studying the word of God will help your conviction stand. It will take away the impurities. It will take away the impurities. Look at me. Look up. Look up. It is dangerous that you saved up to 1.7 million to pay for a three-bedroom flat. And the Lord now begins to speak to you and say, there's a need in my house. Go and give it. Listen. Listen. That is where I'm talking about. I'm not talking about you have 20 million in your account. And the Lord is telling you to give 500,000. You don't need conviction. Because 500,000 minus 2, taking it away from 20 million is as if you have not done anything. 
But when the 1.7 million is, is all you have and you have saved it for over one year plus, and you went to the pastor and he asked the pastor, sir, how much do you think this thing will cost? And he tells you 1.7 million. You say, I'm coming. You go back. Have I heard from the Lord? Am I now convinced that this is God? Because I want you to know that 1.7 million is gone. Gone in the sense that no three bedroom for you. You will retain that place where you are living, number one. Or you will get a quick notice. So you must be convinced about it. Yes, sir. There are certain shame that go with certain giving. There are certain things you have to cut down that goes with certain giving. That all of a sudden, you were in a duplex. But because you were urged, convinced by the Lord to do it, you moved to two rooms, I'm telling you. But all of a sudden, you also wonder. From that place, <laughs> I've seen this God. Yes, sir. But you must be convinced. Number one, have you heard from the Lord? Did I hear from the Lord? Number two, am I convinced about it? Number three, the altar to put the seed. It's not enough to sow the seed. It's not enough to give. The ground matters. Because you're giving. You are like a farmer. You can't just, you can't just drop anything anywhere. I like that man's face. Let me go and give him this offering that I want. You don't give because of face. You don't give because of friendship. You give because you were commanded. Don't give because of a relationship. That you are dating a man of God does not mean you should give. Because that's a dating giving. It will not produce anything. I'm sure I'm telling you some things here. You find some people. They are dating a man of God. They want to get married. But the lady in question works and occupies a very rich position. So she gets a whole lot of money. She gets money. So sometimes, you know, the man, the church needs something. So she says, I'm sowing. She's not sowing, no. In, 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 the, cont in the context of proper sowing, she's giving to a guy. To help her guy's ministry come up. Now, <laughs> wait. The Lord might check her heart and see that it's genuine. And one way or the other, give something. But I'm trying to tell you, tell you something. That the original, <laughs> original foundation is not because she's sowing. The original, this is, this is my guy's ministry. I've seen people who take their tithes. And give to their guy. That okay you too. You are a man of God. But the person you are giving to. Does not feed you spiritually. The person you are giving to. Is not your altar spiritually. But emotion. Are you with me? You know, it's like Sister One Naker wakes up and she collects her salary and she just runs to Pastor Chi. You two, you are a man of God. Take my tithe. Lay hand on me. That hand, she, he laid. <laughs> are, you, are you with me? From that day, you notice that the certain mosquito started following you. It is as a result. <laughs> the altar is important because the altar is the ground. How many of you are following what I'm saying? All right. That's number what? If you don't give in the right altar, there shall be no harvest. So before you give, ask yourself this question. So what are the signs that I'm in the right altar? There are a few signs you look at. Check the altar if the signs of the spirits are accompanied there. That is, 
Is the word of God taught in spirit and in truth? I'm not saying the man of God is shouting and jumping up and sweating. So you say, this guy, he did labor too much. <laughs> Check if there's a proper worship. Worship that emanates from the throne of heaven. Real worship that breaks you. Check if there are testimonies of changed lives. Testimonies of changed life. Not confused life. Changed lives. That means you walk with certain people. They tell you their story. That listen brother. When I came to this man of God. I came to this ministry. I was trekking. My name was. I studied trekology. My, I was using Legedis Benz. Today, that thing you see there is a prophet, is a sign that whatever you hear here is true. Not only that, my commitment with the Lord, my spiritual life, my family, things are just working. That's a changed life. Check if people are truly saved. Is there salvation in the place? Do people come in there and give their life to Christ and receive the person of the Holy Spirit? These signs proves to you that the altar is sanctified. Then you look at the man's life. Are his words his bond? I told you how that many years ago, I did not know. I did not know. I was just doing ministry as one who is just doing ministry. But I didn't know that certain people who came were, had already had certain experiences. Because don't expect that all the people you will see in church are all unbelievers who gave their life to Christ. No. There are certain believers who also left certain believing ministry to join you. So this brother in question was monitoring my life. So like I just gave an announcement on Sunday that we'll be doing certain changes and renovations in church and it's going to cost so much. And that Sunday, this past Sunday now, I was not led by the spirit to call for anything. So I told people to go home. If I was led by the spirit, I have to hear to do what he asked me to do. If he didn't speak to me about it, he would provide and we'll do it. And I came that day and I told the people, the Lord, we are going to do something in church. I remember it was in the world. We are going to do something there. And the people came out to give, to, to pledge, not give yet, they pledge. The next week, we have started. Someone came that I ministered to and just two of them and just said, sir, that thing you told me works, sir. Here's this, this is my tithe. This is my, my, this is my pastor's offering. And I said, wow, I prayed for this person. While the person was going, another one came. I said, ah, thank you, Jesus. There's money now to start the thing. I don't have to wait for the people. I should be the first giving, giver. And that's how I do my life. So I called the people and we started. So the people came to church just like you came now. And they saw that work was going on. That was the first time. Then the second time, so this brother came to me and said, you are a real man of God. I said, why? He said, because I've observed. You will not know that people are observing your life. Your life is a mirror. He said, I've observed that. You will give an announcement before we even bring the thing you have already started. He said, you are a true man of God. So it dawned on me, oh, people are even watching. I did not know. He said, not like our former church. Where even when we finish contributing the whole money, we will still not see the cutting. We will not see the mic. We will not see anything. Then we will come to church to tell us, Tawada, Shalama, Hosea. So the ground is not fertile. How many of you are with, are you getting what I'm saying? Number. Leave it like that. Number four, five, four, four, five. I don't know. So we are looking at what? Things to consider before you give. The first question is what? Did you hear from? Number two. Are you convinced? Number three, check what? Then you also look at the man of God. All right? Haven't done all of this. So why do some people don't receive? Why do certain givers? Haven't checked all of this. I want to now give it to you in, in the next 15 minutes and we're out of this place. Number one reason why certain givers don't receive is the purpose of the giving. This is the first reason why certain people don't receive. They are givers, but they will never receive. Because the purpose of giving 
You must understand that when it comes to giving and receiving, it's a product of the heart. This is what determines whether you receive or not, your heart. And because I do not see what is in your heart, I do not see what is in your heart. The only person that sees into your heart is God. But you are bearing the check. You just made a vow. But I'm not seeing your heart. So the purpose of your giving, I don't know. But you came. And six months after, one year after, you're not receiving. And I'm like, what is the problem? Because the only thing I cannot see with your giving is your purpose. Purpose is spiritual. Purpose is in the heart. Purpose is on the inside. Many carry the wrong purpose in mind. And when I talk about purpose, you will be shocked at the things I'm going to say. Purpose is defined as the anticipated outcome that is intended or that guides your planned and actions. It is that anticipated outcome that is intended or that guides your planned actions. That is your purpose. It is that thing on the inside. So, what is the purpose of your giving will determine whether you will receive or not. What do I mean by that? Do you know that there are people who give just to be noticed? You know one thing? They have received. There is no giving that you do before God that you will not get something. If you want to be noticed and people notice that you give something, that is a give, that is a receiving. You have received. That is, you have just received. What did you receive? Notice me. There are people who give to be noticed. Oh! I went for a conference many years ago. My God. I did not finish the conference. I left. The moment the man of God came out, hallelujah, glory, hey, the whole place was in cha 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 cha. I said, God, the conference. He said, now before we do anything, just take out your giving, hallelujah. Woo! <laughs> Men just pulled out dollars, pounds. One, one thousand naira, some people just hold it. The moment they lifted it, they lifted it, they spread it. You could see the dollar. Huh? Why change Jimji? <laughs> I just folded it, keep it, kept it like this. Uh-uh. Boy, you not know, be smart in. And there was a lady that was just looking at me. She just. I said, this conference. So while I was doing that, there was a brother on the other end too. He just connected with me. We were in the same atmosphere. I noticed that the brother just sat down. He just is. <laughs> he just sat down. I just did like this. He said, ah. I said, leave them. So when they were going out to go and give the thing, we just sat down. So I was asking him, what, what, what did they teach? I said, it's faith, Jerry. I said, it's faith. He says, yes. I said, ah, what kind of thing is all this one? I said, well, it is well. They came back. When they would sow another seed, I noticed that the lady that was, I was telling was now talking to the guy and said, was telling the guy, I think you don't have anything. She just opened her bag. Was counting the 1,000. The guy was just looking. <laughs> was much. Maybe 20 or something. Just give to the guy. The guy just. So from the other end, I was looking at the guy. Because you are angry. Just some minutes ago. So let me see what you. The guy just folded the money. I knew that this one would die poor.
But I just said to myself, because this is, I just felt, I just said, maybe this is how they do it here. Maybe they are, the way they were trained, but if it's a conference, and this kind of thing, Paul already said, you can make another man's faith. Did you get what I'm saying? What is your motive? What is the motive? For some people, the reason they give is to be the highest giver in the church. That's just their motive. They weigh everybody. You know, this one folds often. This one fold. This one fold. This one fold. I'll beat all this way. That's a motive. God is not involved in this giving. It's just your motive. A story is given in Acts chapter 5, verse 1. Let's go there. From verse 1, Acts chapter 5. <laughs> Somebody say motive. Acts chapter 5 from verse 1. Okay? But a certain man named Ananias. Somebody say Ananias. Say it again, say Ananias. With Sapphira, his wife. They sold a possession. That means they own a land. They sold it. Verse 2. And they kept back part of the price. His wife also being private to it. That means she knew about it. And they brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. It's your property. That's not a problem. But the problem is found in verse 3. From verse 3, you see something. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Verse 4. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in your heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. The moment he was speaking, the man dropped dead and died. What was the problem? He sold the land, let's say for 10 million, and kept 5 million, and took 5 million and went to the apostles and dropped it and told them, I gave all. I want you to know one thing. If you read Acts chapter 5, you will not understand what truly happened. Because Acts chapter 5 from verse 1 just started with, there was a man, Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, they sold the land. You will not truly know what happened, what led to that, until you go to chapter 4. Go to chapter 4, verse 36. Because the book was not written in chapters and verses. There was something that transpired in the church as of that time that led to Ananias doing this thing. What was it? Look up. This time, the church was in need and people were spreading giving. They were giving. There was a man by the name, he's called Joseph. This is where you get Joseph Moreno. Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barabbas. Why did they give him Barnabas? What is the meaning of Barnabas? Which is being interpreted the son of consolation. He was a Levite of the country of Cyprus. What did this guy do? Verse 37. The Bible told us that this guy, having land, he sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. So the guy sold his land, took all of the money and brought it at the apostles' feet and he did it at a time when the church needed money. So when he brought it, they say, what's your name? He said, Joseph. He said, no more will you be called Joseph. You shall be called Barnabas. You are a son of consolation. Thank you for this thing you did. We have so much now we can give to others. And Ananias heard it. He was there. He said, no be only you, they go give name. No be only you go collect title. Me self, I go collect title. Honey, ma, we go sell that our land. Wait there for me, you know? We will sell it for 10 million, but we will not give all of them. We will also tell them, because who knows whether this guy kept part. The wife said, Abio. Who so that was how Ananias and Sapphira went and sold their own land too. The motive was not to give. They never intended to receive. They wanted to show. They wanted title. 
So they sold the land, took half, and gave half. They went, they came to and dropped it at the apostles' feet. She been for your feet, then they drop and to collect the title. See my own too. And Peter spark. Ananias, say, sir. <laughs> he was expecting to say, Your name shall be God. <laughs> ah, your name shall be called the healer of nations. Instead, he said, Why has Satan feed your heart? <laughs> he said, Hey, <laughs> Anna, eh? why has Satan feed your heart to lie to us? Why? Must, eh? <laughs> Before he could ask that, wow, the guy died. The wife went to the market. He said, go and call. The news spread. The wife came. Instead of the woman to own up and say, oh God, man, talk true. Now nah, my husband, now nah, no, I'm not nah, stupid man. <laughs> she refused and joined. Peter said, you too? How much did he say the line? He said, it's five million. And we gave all of them. You gave all of them? You lied to the Holy Ghost too. Your husband is just there. He just, hey, Anna, in Ugo. <laughs> Safari, I just dropped. Bah. That's how he died. The Bible says, great fear came to the church. Which means, anybody who planned to do such a thing, the thing got eradicated immediately. So their purpose was to be recognized and to be given a name. The highest givers in church. Mm -hmm. The givers in billion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6 verse 3. <laughs> Bias of generator. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Matthew 6 verse 3. It's your dear uncle. So we're looking at the purpose. Check for the purpose. Some people give to be close to the man of God. It's a purpose. That's their own purpose. They didn't give, they didn't give to receive. They have received. So you examine. I'm showing you one of the reasons why people give and don't receive. And we will not know. How do I know? You not start crying. I've been giving. I've been giving to this church. <laughs> but when thou give alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. Verse four. That thy alms may be in secret, and thy father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. Is this not better? This is Jesus. That's number one. Number two. Reason why people give and don't receive is not only the purpose, but the motive. The motive of giving. That means the intent. Motive is defined as the reason for the action. That is, that which gives purpose and direction to behavior. You see, the other one is purpose. This one is motive. This one is what gives definition to the purpose. That is your motive. That means what is, what is boiling in you? What is fueling that you're giving? Can I tell you something? Any motivation outside love will not come. There's no giving. There's no receiving. If your motive is not love, you won't receive. If your motive is not love, love for God, love for Jesus, love for his servant, love for his vision, if it's not there, you will not receive, no matter what you give. You must have love. You must be motivated. Paul says, the love of God constraineth us. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3. If it's not love, if your motive is not love, forget it. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, 
and I have no charity, it profited me nothing. Give me the amplified. It must be love. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be bound or in order that I may glory, but I have not loved God's love in me, I gain nothing. Give me the message. So stop looking and say, Pastor, the one I gave yesterday I did not receive. If I give everything I own to the poor and even go to the stake to be born as a martyr, but I don't love, I have gotten nowhere. So no matter what I say, what I believe and what I do, I am bankrupt without love. If love is not your motivation, forget it, child of God. You won't receive anything. No matter the service you do for me, do for God, do in the house of God, if it's not love motivated, forget it. Forget it. Forget it. Forget it. It must be love. You are prophesying without love. You won't gain nothing. You may gain recognition from men. Heaven will not recognize you. You must have love. Love should be your motivation for giving. Not so that people will respect you. I will so give that they will be licking my shoe. Na dog, na ingo lika. Luke chapter 21, let's read from verse 1. You will see what happened in the ministry of Jesus Christ. But sometimes some people criticize people, criticize us for nothing. Look, look at, from King James, please, look at what happened. The Bible says, and he looked up, this is Jesus Christ. One day, people were giving offering, he has finished preaching. And saw the rich men casting their gift, remember gift, offerings, into the word treasury, offering box. Verse 2. Look at the way they were giving. And he saw also a certain poor widow casting in thee that two mites. She just came. The, the rich were just going. They would just go. That's exactly what I told you. They just go with the bundle. Uh -uh. And a poor widow just went. Two mites. The thing sounded. They just look. What, what, what was that? Verse 3. And he said of a truth, I say unto you. That this poor widow had cast in more than they all. Because if you read it in the book of Mark, he asked them, who gave more, the most? And the disciples said, ah, Jesus, did they, did they, did they, so they all have small picking children. Question, all these questions. We all you see men, they drop means. They ask this woman, we drop coin. You know, it has a sound. Who gave the most? Now, these men now, Jesus looked at them. If, if when I get church, eh, if I give on a branch, men, I don't, I don't keep people. Ah, master, what do you mean? That woman gave the most. Eh, how? Coin. Can I, can I say? <laughs> what do you want they can buy? He said, those people gave out, look at verse 4. They gave out of the abundance. For all this half of the abundance cast into the offerings of God. So they were offerings of God. I want you to know that in those days, the offerings of God. And in, in, in my, people, you see people live there. Of, heaven, heaven will shock people. There are some people that want to enter heaven, they'll just close it. Come on, go to that place. <laughs> you that told people that give it. Come, come, come here. People like us, you tell us. Because I said the truth out of love. But she of her penury had cast in all the living that she had. That was when the disciples understood what Jesus meant. Ah. So all she had was that two coins. That's what you call the widow's might. But these people gave out of their abundance. He said, in heaven, heaven recognizes one more. Motive. Those ones were showing this one honored God. Number three. Another reason why some givers don't receive is because they do not understand what we call the patience of a giver. The patience of a giver.
Can I tell you something? Every giver is like a farmer. Your giving is a seed. When you sow it, there is no farmer that sows in the morning and harvests in the evening. So you must understand what we call the patience of a giver. That when you give, you calm down. Do you remember, how many of you did that, those experiments in school, primary school especially, maybe when you were in primary two, primary three, primary four, they told you to plant maize, corn, beans, they put you, they tell you to, you quickly do it. They, they, they show you in diagram that the thing will grow. You, you did it in the evening when you came back from school. Then the next morning you went there and start crying. Mommy, it has not grown. <laughs> how many of you, did it happen to you? I know what you did because I did what you did. You quickly begin to think that there's a problem and you begin to uproot it. To check. Mommy, it's still like that. But nobody told us that it takes days. It takes weeks. The thing will have to die first. Germinate and start producing. We were not told. That you have to wait after three weeks. Which is 21 days. Are you with me? You wait first. Nobody told you. But in a hurry, you quickly. So you sow a seed on Sunday. By Wednesday, you are checking your alert. The patience of a giver. You must have patience. Exercise patience. And every time the devil reminds you, you always say, thank you, Jesus. Because you did your own. You have done what he asked you to do. Then leave him to do what he will do. It's one of the reasons why some givers don't receive. They don't have patience. And the last one. Many do not know that after giving, you go back to water your giving. You must learn how to water your giving. Give me 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6. How do I water what I have given? How do I water my seed? By praying and giving thanks. Don't just give and go home and start sleeping. You say, ah! Don't be said and dupe me so. <laughs> the little money, they take do business, they collect back. Can we read it together? One, two, go. I have planted. Ace, have you planted? Ask your neighbor, have you planted? It says Apollos have what? Watered. Who gives the increase? Is it Pastor Bina? Did you see my name there? We only pray, Father, she has done what you told her. That's why when it comes to certain giving, I'll ask, is it the Lord that told you? Go and go there. Go and talk to him. So I'm a servant. I'll come and say, Father, that thing you told her, do it for her in Jesus' name. Or you'll be going home. You will go home. When I gave those things that the Lord asked me to do, you sleep and wake up. Sometimes you, you to look as if you are dreaming. You wake up only to look at the garage. To say, oh, Sagbara, oh, David, hi. I might call them, I might collect this thing back. Maybe I know here well. You leave it. You have done your part. You must die first. Some of you want big things from God, but you can't do big things for him. But you want big things from him, but you can't do big things for him. <laughs> if there is no for, there will never be from. Are you with me? The things that were written were written for our words. Learn it. Learn this one. Learn this one. And can I say something? 
Always have a picture in mind before you give of what you truly want. Sometimes we give without, give a name to your giving. Is it a child? Do you have a name for it? Do you want next level in your business? Give it a name. Are you tired of appearing before every day they are visa, they deny you? Is your name denial? Are you tired of appearing there? Give it a name. Say, Lord, I'm tired. I'm tired. You are just one seed away from what you want from the Lord. Just one seed away. And I'm telling you, you get it. One seed away. Some of you are just one offering away, one sacrifice away, one gift away. Can you put that faith together and say, Lord, I, I, I want to do it. There are some of you who has been impressing in your heart to do something. Since last year, you, they say no, no carry over. You carry this one over. Still, that voice has not let you rest. You are still saying, <laughs> Do what he asks you to do. You are just one instruction away from. And once you follow that instruction, you will have so much peace that you know that this is settled. I speak from a volume of experience, not just as one who read the scriptures. Volume of experience. Volume of experience. There is no day I do not give. No day I don't make sense. The funny thing is that sometimes some things come to you and before they even come, the Lord would have told you that something is coming. This is what it's coming for. Nothing moves here until something moves here. Some of you over time, familiarity has made you become so stingy. Look at me. I'm saying the truth. Familiarity with altars. Familiarity with men of God. Familiarity with the gospel. I know people who have met wrong men of God in their lives and they have dined and eaten and stayed with them to the point they have been exposed to some things. It has closed them up. They no longer believe God. I'm telling you. They no longer believe God. It has now become an evil disease. So if you preach a message like this, they struggle with it because they have seen. They have seen who? They have seen. It has now become so bad that many ministers of the gospel don't live the life of giving but we preach it. You can't practice it. When was the last time the Lord really nudged you, spoke to you and said, do this? When we worship you, our God, you are worthy to be praised. When was the last night?
you're a man of God, you're a minister. Things around you are dying, they are decaying. It's a sign of death. No life, you can, you can sense it. There's no freshness around you. No freshness. Wonderful counselor, mighty God. There's no freshness. You, you, you know. Wombs are there, nothing. Do you know some people can don out millions and go for they go from one hospital to the other. <laughs> but they can't trust God. Your name is of you can't trust God. To you, that God is it, not like that. The way the people say it is not the way he is. They come easy, they worship this God. <laughs> From generation out of generation. Thank you for listening. For more of this, you can worship with us at the Gifted House, Ifakawagudu Expressway, Lagos, or call. 08185606792 or 08072952657